And I've got that Matthew recording, yep. All right, I think we're up, Christine. Um, I know we're gonna take a look at some of your slides. slides. So welcome everybody to our monthly membership meeting, January 7th, 2021. And Christine McCluskey, our vice president has created another fabulous slideshow. Take it away. Okay. All right, briefly, tonight's program is one that, that I love, Turkey Vultures. Um, Hannah Partridge is a speaker and she'll be coming up and be introduced in a few minutes, but she's got some really cool uh, like nighttime video of uh, we're, we're like flies on the walls looking at vultures. She's a vulture, black vulture researcher. So can't wait for that. Yes, a face only a mother could love. Yeah. All right, and as you guys have been hearing tonight, we're also going to be sharing our members' photos. Um, we've asked, we have a number of photographers in the group, and, um, and you don't have to be a professional. We just like to see what you've been seeing, um, but we've got some folks that are really talented, um, and we'll share those, and we welcome you to continue to share after this program. If you want to be in next year or see some things going forward, um, you know, when I put these monthly pre-shows on, uh, I try to collect pictures of rarities or just interesting things that people have seen in their backyard. So you're welcome to share photos with me um, going forward throughout the year as you, as you see fit. We hope you will. Sounds good. Uh, just a quick reminder that if you like birds and beans coffee, which is conservation uh, coffee that uh, benefits places where uh, birds live, you can go to www.birdsandbeans.com and buy coffee from them. It's a good cause. Okay, so as we were talking about um, pictures that we feature at the beginning of our monthly meeting, um, these are two standouts that we have. Um, the first in the right corner is an older bird. This is actually a shot from October, but I thought this is one of the best I've seen from um, our local folks, because this is out in Ray Farms, the magic field as we call it. So, um, you know, they're hiding in the grasslands and stuff. So this is a really great look at his face um, that I thought was pretty cool that uh, Dennis shared and I, no, we also saw Lucy's wonderful Rufus hummingbird um, in our last meeting, but um, this picture was particularly uh, spectacular. I thought a really good look at it. So um, that's included and that's still around. So that's a, a, a shot from uh, December. And as far as I know, I believe Lucy and Len still have this lovely little lady visiting them at their home feeder. Um, this shot, uh, Martina, I don't know if you want to unmute yourself a little bit to talk about the criders. So this is a red tail hawk, but it's a spe specific subspecies. Yeah. Um, so criders red tailed hawk is sort of the prairie subspecies of red tailed hawk. Um, and you can see it's very pale. Um, one of the best ways to tell is that white base to the tail. Um, I didn't give Christine the other photo, but you can always look on my eBird. Um, and you'll see that it's pure white below, no belly band, no markings whatsoever. Um, so they, they're usually a wet, the winter in like the Gulf Coast, um, like Texas, Louisiana, um, down to Florida. But uh, I think this was the fourth reported one in North Carolina of the subspecies. So it's Very a neat cool. subspecies. Yeah, something to look out for. Yeah, neat, neat, neat. And um, Mary Claire had this really cute shot of a barred owl that she had just this week over in uh, Winghaven, which um, even though it's a pretty common species and many of us have them and it's our most common owl, um, we never tire looking at pictures of these owls. So, and this is the owl, uh, Lynn Baker, that you were talking about that you heard in your yard. That's a barred owl. That, that would be this one. Here. Uh, Richard got some great shots of the uh, American bittern that's at Chantilly. Uh, I have it as a herd only, and probably many of our local birders do as well. It's very secretive, hides out in the reeds. 
Um, so it was not an easy one to get photographed of. And um, I just thought these were really special. So um, these are these are pretty they're, cool. They're very, they're very special. I flushed it one day, but there's no way that I even barely saw it. So thank you, Richard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's he's a, a big bird, but he's stealthy, man. He knows how to hide out. So not easy to see. You want to okay, start this one? On to, moving on to the annual Christmas bird count results. I'll do the first two, Christine, and you can do the others. You can read the stats there. It was a big year. Um, Gaston County had 84 species. And um, Steve Tracy told me late breaking news that one of the brand new species that was reported there, believe it or not, was a common raven. He said he just figured that out right before the meeting. So that was cool. Nice. Um, and of course it says black and white warbler new entry. Yeah, and yeah that was new, even though it's not terribly rare around here. That was the first time it made it into the Gaston count. Well, and the Lake Norman count was, was fun, uh, rainy a little bit, but again, a record 103 species. The, um, what we had tied two years at 102 or something, Christine. Yeah, and, I believe uh, that's right. You can see the new entries, blue gray gnatcatcher, bullock oriole, and uh, some Merlin, osprey, sedgerins, greater scalp, Lincoln sparrow. So a fun day there too. Yeah. And thanks nice. to Martina, Kevin, and John for those great photos. Okay. Um, and I guess I, I should also point out for anybody watching this and especially some of our newer members, the Christmas bird count is an annual thing and um, normally something we love to share with new people. It's a really cool experience. It's a good time to um, introduce some experienced birders to some new birders so they can kind of check what it's, out, what it's all about. Um, really going a little more hardcore, trying to identify as many species as you can for the day and it's citizen science. Um, this year was a little wacky because of COVID. We really, um, limited the teams, but I hope um, those of you who have not done one before will consider joining us next year. We'd, we'd really like to expand the group. So, um, that being said, we, we have the four are the local, the closest ones around here. Um, so uh, Malia talked about the other two. Charlotte, of course, our hometown is um, another. We had a hundred species. Um, the average is, is around 90, so 100 is a pretty good day, not record breaking, but really good. Um, Martina had an ash throated flycatcher, which is a, a big rarity, and that's a new one for the count. Plus, she was able to get a fabulous picture of it, so that was pretty cool. Um, since 1941, they recorded 155 unique species during the Christmas bird count, which I thought was a pretty cool stat. Um, the pictures below are mine from PD. Um, that's a really cool count because it's the only day of the year that they open the National Wildlife Refuge to us, all areas of it, including those that are normally close to the public. So um, you really get to see this, some behind the scenes and, and better attempts to look at ducks and things that aren't always so readily available. Um, so we had 92 species on that count. Um, Leconte sparrow, which is one of our current celebrity rarities uh, at Ray Farm. So we had one here in PD, which is about an hour away for those of you who don't know that, uh, grassland bird. And I included this other picture, it's um, grackles, no big deal grackles, but this was, I felt like I was in the birds movie. Yeah, I had never seen such a big flock. Um, we recorded them at, at, at 5,000 was our rough estimate of how many we saw there. I don't know if you could see they're sitting down in the field as well. And they flowed over our cars while we were driving and it was a, a fun experience to see that many. Go ahead. Okay, let me, well, this is uh, something we, brand, we just introduced um, and it's basically <clears throat> to celebrate the start of 2021, Mass member Patty Maston came up with an idea for having a year long Mecklenburg Audubon backyard birding challenge on eBird. So since so many people are st staying home now, um, it launched on January 1st. And if you go to our website, mechbirds.org and click on the newsletter at the top, 
you can read all about it and there even find instructions uh, to how you can join our backyard birding challenge. And one more part of it, Judy's leading an eBird webinar. If you don't know how to use eBird, um, Judy will teach you um, on January 14th at 7 p.m. Um, and as you can see on the slide, we're doing all six local counties, the two in South Carolina, some of our members live there, four in North Carolina. Um, the, the, the people who will be the alleged winners, although we will all win from doing it, uh, the most lists and the most species in each county, county, it does go all year, but we will show a monthly leaderboard um, in the newsletter and you can find that various places. Bragging rights, year-end pri uh, prizes, and um, you join by January 15th. Patty Maston, I don't know if you can um, unmute your microphone. You, you may not be able to on the, on the fly here. Anyway, um, she, uh, she is the person you register with. So send her an email that's in, in the newsletter. Um, and uh, don't forget about the tutorial, January 14th at seven. Anything else, Christine? I kind of ran through that. Um, no, I think you covered most of it. I just wanted to tell people that, you know, I've been doing it more in earnest since COVID, really tracking my backyard and tr just trying to best the most species I've seen in a day um, and to add to my yard list. And um, it's a lot of fun. So even if you live in an apartment, even if you have a small plot or not a particularly birdie plot it's always it, it's kind of a cool way to keep yourself interested to see what other people are doing and to hopefully catch something a little more unusual um, and it's fun to look at the stats and see what other folks are doing and um, we can talk about it you know on a monthly basis with with the zoom and or at the meetings when we finally go live again um, to kind of see uh, what's been going on. We figured it would really um, spark interest and conversation and we can talk about feeders and seed and all kinds of wonderful stuff. And um, so don't be intimidated about the technology. It's, now that we're doing this, it's the perfect time if you've been resisting learning eBird. It's pretty straightforward and we're all committed to helping people get on board. So uh, don't be afraid. I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Okay, just promoing our next meeting, uh, which will be Thursday, February 4th. Um, we're looking forward to going south of the border and see, talk, hearing about birds of Durango, Mexico. And uh, that's with Brian Sharp, who is at Stanley Community College. And uh, who's, who's that, that lovely picture you got there again, Christine? That was a tufted jay. There's a lot of cool things to see in Mexico. So I think that'll be a nice, uh, a nice program. All right. Yeah. All right, moving on, let's get to the, our two main events tonight. Um, let's see, I want to welcome a few new members quickly, and I'll just read off your names since I can't figure out if you're here or not, but we've got Jennifer, Elizabeth, Cheryl, Judith, Michelle, Laura, and Jeannie, who's the one with the Bullocks Oriole coming to her feeders and has been letting other birders enjoy it. Um, and also Angie's been letting us stalk her Bullocks and Lucy and Lynn, um, who whenever you invite us out to see these, these rare birds. So welcome new members and thanks to everybody else. All right, our next uh, speaker, uh, speaking of stalking birds, Steve Coggin, who uh, coordinates our bird walks and field trips. He's going to unmute his uh, microphone and tell us what we've got on tap. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. It's good to see you. And uh, we have, oh, uh, I guess I have to go through the disclaimers first. We're <laughs> birding ahead. safely, folks. Next slide, please. Blah, blah. We do lots of things. <laughs> Limit the number of people on a trip, masks. Uh, these gulls are talking about it. Uh, you have to register with the leader of the trip. And sometimes there's a wait list and Here's some coming up uh, this Saturday at McDowell Prairie and Copper Island. Unfortunately, that one is full. As far as I know, there's no wait list yet. Next week, McAlpine Creek Park. That's Judy on a Thursday. 
And then that weekend, uh, a big trip we take to Huntington Beach, South Carolina to get the winter birds down there. And it's, a, I think, one of the best trips of the year. So register for some trips. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, so um, one thing I was going to mention is that came up in the last few days is that we are going to be part of Audubon, North Carolina's Advocacy Day. And uh, for everybody who wants to check into that, some people that involves having Zoom meetings with North Carolina legislators about topics that are important to birds. And uh, that will be February 10th. So I'm going to try to put uh, the link to register for that in the chat. So I'll do that. I uh, just wanted to bring that to your attention. And um, one other person I want to call on, Matthew Withrow, if you'll un unmute your, your mic. Um, so a couple of weeks ago on Facebook, I saw Matt, Matthew uh, say he was uh, headed out to do some twitching. Well, <laughs> I uh, wasn't sure what that was. At first, I thought it might be twerking, but I really couldn't see Matthew dancing like Miley Cyrus. <laughs> Anyway, Matthew, tell us tell us what twitching is and what you saw and how far you went and all of that. Yeah, I don't I don't have the the Molly Cyrus skills, unfortunately. Um, but so so twitching is basically just going out and driving driving long distances to see rare birds. Um, and while it's always a treat to go down to the Outer Banks, uh, the the stars aligned kind of just just perfectly uh, to to get some really special birds. Uh, both both down there and on the way. Um, so it started with I'm going to go to Chapel Hill to, or to Raleigh to see the buried thrush, but then I can drive a little bit further to see the vermilion flycatcher and a little bit further to the Outer Banks to see all that good stuff that was down there. So I have no idea how far it is to the Outer Banks, but it's about six hours. Um, but I saw, I, I was very impressed. I've always been kind of hesitant to, to go go twitch some birds, uh, but so, cause I don't want to drive all that way and not see the birds, but I saw all five of the birds I was trying to get. I saw the, the buried thrust, the vermilion flycatcher, McEvillery's warbler, uh, rough-legged hawk. And I think there was another one that I might be forgetting, but um, yeah, it was a great, great trip. Um, yeah, birding is just such a great activity to, to, to do. Uh, it's it's easy, easy to socially distance. Um, you know, I ran into other burgers, but everybody was good about wearing masks. Uh, we were all outside, you know, so nobody was driving together, um, you know, going through drive throughs and stuff, but it was, it was a great trip. And, uh, I, I love, love Outer Banks. So I'll go back in a couple of weeks. So. Well, uh, that's amazing, Matthew. We, uh, if anybody wants to know about twitching, they can uh, get get some more details from you. But I just thought that was interesting, and apparently that's a British term. I think they call birding in general twitching, maybe. But anyway, all right, thank you. Next up, Larry Leamy, will you unmute your microphone, please? There he is. Hey, Larry. So yeah. I'm going to let you introduce our fabulous speaker tonight, Hannah Partridge. It's my pleasure. I wanted to and good evening, all all of you. I wanted to. Uh, start out by telling you that last year, the Mecklenburg Audubon Society started a new grants program for undergraduate and graduate students at the local colleges and universities. And the grants were awarded for students that submitted proposals based on conservation research or education basically related in some way to the general study of birds or habitat preservation or restoration of bird populations. But one of our first recipients is our speaker tonight, Hannah Parkridge. She was awarded a grant from Mass based on her work on the effects of urbanization in vulture populations, on vulture populations. I want to tell you also that Hannah got her bachelor's degree, this is interesting, from the University of South Dakota, studying the effect of insecticides on endangered dragonflies. I thought that was very interesting. Presently, Hannah is a master's student at UNC Charlotte and who's going to pursue her PhD starting in the fall of 2021. So tonight she's going to tell us about urbanization of vultures. This should be very interesting because she's going to be talking about local populations of vultures right here in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. So it should give us a good understanding of roosting and nesting, foraging habits, etc. So it's my pleasure, folks, to introduce tonight Hannah Partridge. 
Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share this real quick and we will get started. All right. Can you guys see this? Looking good. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All righty. So again, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm excited to be here and share all of these results with you guys. Um, so over about the last year and a half or so, um, Dr. Sarah Gagne and I at the University of, Carol or, uh, University of North Carolina at Charlotte have been um, researching these vulture populations here around Charlotte. And so we're looking at um, essentially the local and the landscape features that are associated with these populations um, and their behaviors. So we have two main projects that I've split up um, and we'll get into that in just a second. So as Everyone here probably knows we have a lot of vultures. Um, the vultures are extremely successful in cities. Um, and really most of that is because they use these man-made structures for a lot of their activities. So they roost on a lot of the transmission towers, um, like the one on the left there. Uh, they forage, I mean, they use roadkill on the roads for foraging and then also dumpsters. They use dumpsters a lot, a lot more than I expected. Um, and then they also nest in these old abandoned buildings. So they are very successful in our urban areas um, and they just, they use a lot of these man-made structures. And vultures, although they're not as lovable as a lot of other birds, they are extremely critical for um, carcass consumption and disease dynamics in our cities. So in areas where they've lost a lot of their vulture populations, um, like in India, uh, they've lost up to like 99% of their vulture populations and they're struggling now with rabies and other diseases because these vultures kind of take care of that for us. <clears throat> but really, despite their importance, these birds are largely unstudied. Um, there's really not a lot of research that has been done on them or is currently being done. So there's a lot that we can learn from just these basic studies of these birds. So for the two studies that I'm gonna introduce you to today, uh, we're studying them in the Charlotte metropolitan area. So that's these 12 counties that surround Charlotte. So all of our sites are in here. Although there are a lot of other really cool vulture populations in other areas, these are the ones that we're focusing on for these studies. All right, so onto the first study. Um, for our first one, we're studying the vulture roosting site selection. So what habitat and landscape features are associated with their roosting sites and with their roosting numbers. All right, so these are all of our roosting sites. In total, we have about 30 that we're studying. Um, and we started this in 2019 and are continuing it through 2021. So although there are a lot more roosting sites out there that they use, we're studying only permanent roosting sites, which are those that they use all year round. Um, there are other roosts that they might use seasonally or just overnight for one night. Um, and although those are interesting too, we're only studying these permanent roosts. So they have birds at them all year. <clears throat> okay, so roost surveys. We're conducting these roost surveys um, of the vulture, of the 30 vulture roosts uh, throughout the winter. So we conduct them monthly from November through March before sunrise. So it's pretty early because they do leave the roost really, really early. Um, and so to get the count of these roosting vulture numbers that we can kind of correlate it with the habitat and landscape features, we need to get out there and um, conduct these surveys. <clears throat> so as I said, they do leave really, really early. So this is with some uh, data that we've collected. This is the proportion of the roost remaining with respect to the time of sunrise. So I know this is kind of a confusing graph, but what this is showing is that essentially this line here is the number of vultures at the roost. And this first line is sunrise. So we found that um, essentially these birds are leaving in large numbers even before sunrise. And there's no standardized method in the literature for surveying these vulture roosts. So going into this project, we didn't really have an idea of the best way to do this. So um, just having this information, gathering this has been really beneficial to not only our project, but to hopefully future projects as well. So then we have the roost survey numbers, and then we needed the habitat and landscape features. So we conducted 
these habitat surveys to understand the uh, local or the habitat associations with the numbers. <clears throat> so essentially, we're just looking at the area immediately surrounding the roost. And so if this transmission tower is what they're roosting on, we're looking at the shrubbery and the vegetation immediately around it. Uh, so we primarily collected information on the height of the roost and the height of the vegetation, and then the land cover surrounding that roost in a very close area. Um, and by land cover, I mean mostly the tree sort of species. <coughs> And then for our landscape variables, we're looking at three main variables. So we're looking at the road density, um, kind of as a metric for um, the carcasses for their foraging. And then we're looking at land cover, which is that middle one there, and deer collisions. So North Carolina does have some good data on deer collisions. So we're using that as well to as another metric for the carcasses around. <clears throat> and so, um, what this is showing here, these three photos, the backgrounds are those variables. So this is the roadway density. This is the middle of Charlotte. So it obviously has more roads. Um, land cover here, that's a lot of developed and then forested land. And then of course here, Charlotte. But all of these rings, the middle of this ring, this is just one of our sites, but we added these series of buffers around each site. And so we have 10 buffers that surround each site. And Essentially, it's just a small buffered area that allows us to study exactly what is in that little area. So our 10 buffers, um, using some previous literature, we have sized those buffers so that the smallest size is about the size of um, their core daily home range. So the size or the area that they're using on just a daily basis where they nest or where they roost and forage. And then the largest one is um, their average annual home range. So it's about 20 kilometers and they can and do range a lot farther. That's just what we found in the literature as a sort of average for this species. So we're using that. Okay, so on to the results. And these are preliminary. This is just using the first year of data. So we've got, we'll rework this um, after this year of roosting surveys are completed. But we found that these five features most accurately predict the roosting vulture number. Um, and so that's the vegetation height, the corridor width, wind speed, and then open water and developed land cover within four kilometers. <clears throat> so the vegetation height um, and corridor width, we're thinking that um, they tend to prefer the lower vegetation height with a wider corridor and that corridor if you can imagine these transmission towers, most of them have that right of way. So it's just an open space. Um, and they tend to prefer from what we're seeing, lower vegetation or wider corridor. And we're thinking that that may give them um, a little bit easier access to and from the roost. And it may impact the air currents, making it just that much easier to get going in the morning. And the same for wind speed. Um, the wind, it really helps them get going. And so if it's a windy morning, they are out early, even earlier. And for the open water and developed land cover, um, of course, those are really good food and water sources. The open water, I mean, provides water, of course, but these birds, they are also known to actually fish if they have to, and to use fishing sites. Um, and so they'll just clean up all the fishing carcasses. And the developed land cover, as I mentioned, they're using a lot of dumpsters and a lot of roadkill. So they're pretty highly um, correlated with these sites. So understanding what these populations are actually attracted to and associated with, um, even though they're not endangered now, it could help protect them in the future, but it could also help mitigate any conflicts with humans and vultures. Um, because although I'm sure we all like these birds, a lot of people don't. They're kind of smelly, people don't like seeing scavengers around. And so understanding these features could potentially help mitigate those concerns. Okay, and now on to the second study. Um, so the second study that we really focused on is the urban land cover and vulture nesting success. So we're looking at um, how nesting success varies with the degree of urban land cover that surrounds these nests. 
And so even though, again, they're not struggling currently, um, it is important that we understand how our urban areas are impacting their nesting success. So we only had three nesting successes or nesting sites for this last year. Um, so not very many, hopefully we'll have more next year. But for our nesting observations, so we monitored these sites with weekly observations and we were primarily looking at um, the number of eggs hatched or unhatched and then chick survival and the chick fledging. So we used the number of fledged young as an estimate of that nesting success. So if they have two chicks and both fledged successfully, then um, it's 100% nesting success, that's great. <clears throat> so these photos on the right, um, the first one was not one of our nesting, success, or nesting sites, but it is an old site. But as I mentioned, they like to nest in these old, creepy abandoned buildings. And they just find a little building and nest on the ground in there. And on the right, this is one of our sites. And you can actually see a little black vulture adult huddled down there on her eggs or his eggs. Um, and we'll have more photos coming up. And we are using land cover as a measure of the urban area, similar to the last roosting study. So we're correlating that urban land cover with the nesting success. Okay, so these here are our three nests from this year. Um, of the three nests, there were two successful and unfortunately one did fail. The two uh, further left ones, those were both successful and they both fledged too young, which is great. And the one on the right unfortunately failed. It, um, it was most likely due to disturbance. It's in a very highly urban area. Um, and when I would go to check on it, there was often new trash and there was a lot of homeless activity in the area. So we're expecting that it was just too disturbed um, and the adults didn't get enough time sitting on the eggs and incubating. But we also found that the eggs were laid earlier than expected and the young fledged later than expected. So from what we've been reading and seeing, um, the eggs, we expected them to be laid in March, um, but they were actually a couple weeks earlier than we expected. And the young took about two weeks longer to fledge than we expected. Um, so again, this is only three sites. So this is pretty minimal data but hopefully we will have more information um, after this year of studies. Okay, and so at one of the sites, we did set up a trail camera. So we have a lot of really cool footage. So I will play this video for you. Um, what this video is, is essentially just the entire uh, chick stage. So for this first part of the video, this is zero to one days post hatching. So one of the chicks has hatched at this point and the second one is just starting to hatch and it will be out the next day. But this here is one of the adults and this little lump is one of the chicks. It will get easier to see, I promise. Um, and some of you I know have seen this video. Uh, I will point out a couple interesting things throughout but I'm primarily gonna just let you watch it. So let's play this. So here you can see the adult feeding that chick that's a little bit bigger now. This is one interesting thing that we saw. Um, often the adults would actually feed each other before they fed the chicks. And both adults would uh, brood and incubate and come back and feed. So we thought that was really interesting. It's something that we hadn't seen before with these birds. So how much time does the adult spend with the with the young? Uh, so the, oh, did it stop going? There we go. The adults, they will spend, um, they'll be with them 
for sure, all through fledging. And then they spend at least another nine months with the chicks pretty closely after fledging uh, while they help them feed and learn how to work in the roost. And here, this is actually a fox that came by. And um, I'll make sure that the real video or the full video is accessible too, because it has sound. But in this one, you can actually hear both the adult and the chicks kind of starting to develop that defensive growling and defensive behavior. This is another really interesting thing that we found in these videos. Um, so this is courtship behavior, which from our reading is if the birds have a first nest that fails, they will attempt a second nest. Um, but we haven't seen any evidence of a second mating attempt when they do have a successful nest. So we didn't actually capture a successful mating attempt, just this behavior. Um, but it is really interesting to see this while they have two successful, alive and healthy young. And there's the adults feeding each other again, which is just very interesting to me. And in the video with sound here, you can actually hear their, um, their grunting and growling as they beg for food, which is really interesting sound. And so here, this is one of the last videos before they fledged. So they fledged right around 101 days. So just about three and a half months um, after they hatched. And we did capture a few other species wandering through after they fledged. So this here's a coyote and there is a pup back there somewhere. So it's really hard to see. And then here's a fox as well. Just a couple interesting extras. So this video, um, and the trail camera footage as a whole, it really helped us get a lot of good information on how many times they're feeding the chicks um, and just their daily behavior. When are they present? When are they not present? Um, and the chick growth. So how long is it taking them to grow and fledge, of course, but then also what's their behavior like at these different stages of their life? So we will, um, let's move on. There we go. So we will be conducting a second nesting season um, going forward. So we'll have more footage. We'll definitely use trail cameras again. And we'll also be conducting a second roosting season, which is in progress right now. And we'll be continuing through March. Um, and then starting this spring, we're also going to start looking at the diet composition of urban vulture populations here in Charlotte. So we'll be collecting vulture, these pellets um, from underneath roosts and we'll be dissecting those and analyzing what they're eating, what species they're eating. And especially of interest to me is um, like what kind of plastics and how many plastics are they eating? So hopefully we'll have some good information from that. And then um, as Larry mentioned, I will be starting my PhD here in the fall as well. So in the fall, we're going to start looking at these populations much more broadly. So we're gonna look at the spatial patterns of black vulture populations across the United States um, and especially with a little bit of interest on the range and dispersal of both the juvenile and the adult individuals across that range. So um, we'll have a lot more vulture research coming up in the next few years. 
Um, but I wanted to thank you. I mean, one, thank you all for the funding as part of this project, but also for those who volunteered to help. Um, I know Martina's here. She helped with some uh, roof surveys last year near her house. And just for the many observations and questions, I've received so many very, very helpful observations throughout the last year. Um, so I very much appreciate that. And if there are any of you that would like to see these roosts, um, there are the, the roosting season is going through March. So if you have any interest in going to see one, just let me know. Um, we have quite a few of them that are active. So with that, I think um, it looks like we've got a few questions here. I'm going to open that up. Okay. Um, are you studying both black and turkey vulture vultures? Yes, I am. Um, most of our work is on the black vultures, but we are studying the turkey vultures as well. For now, we're just combining the species. We're not separating them. <laughs> I'm glad someone liked the groundhog photobomb. That's good. I do too. Um, is the longer fledge time related to nutrition? We actually, we don't know. Um, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of research on these birds. So we don't know. Um, it could be, it absolutely could be. Uh, but it could just be old outdated research that could be climate involved. We're not sure. Um, what is my PhD going to be? It will be in, it'll technically be in geography as that's the program, um, but really with a pretty uh, environmental ecological focus. Let's see. Is there a place to watch the video again? Yes, I will make sure that it's shared. Oh, and thank you for sharing my email address. Um, but yes, I will make sure that the video is shared. It is, it's fun. Are there any other questions? I Do you have any on Facebook, Christine? No? Okay, does anybody have any live I, or? I have a question. Okay. Uh, I actually have two questions. One, uh, we were discussing this on, a, on our field trip yesterday. And one of the things uh, somebody asks is we have, a, I mean, there seems to be a very large number of um, vultures in the area, all right? And um, I know some of them are wintering down here and so, so forth. But my question is, um, I know how hard it is to find a nesting site, but they have to be nesting somewhere because their numbers are increasing. Uh, can you give us, and, and the, the the, what goes along with that is the uh, concept of um, if they all, well, like the ab abandoned buildings, well, those abandoned buildings are disappearing. So um, what's going on with that? That's a great question. Um, those abandoned buildings, they are disappearing, unfortunately. There are a lot of them around still, which is great, but they are so hard to find. Um, but going forward, that could absolutely impact the populations. Um, I mean, historically, of course, they didn't use abandoned buildings because there weren't any. And so they would nest in tree stumps and um, in cliff walls. And so they may just revert to some of that behavior again if they start to run low. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, was, go ahead, go ahead, let Jeff. Yeah, so, so still with the nesting sites, I mean, the buildings that you're seeing them nest in, do they tend to be wide open and then a building on the side or are they an abandoned building in the middle of a forest i mean i've seen yeah. I've, I've seen some vultures hanging around abandoned buildings in the middle of a forest which looks like it's hard to get down into but it's like well you know what, what do you look for when you're trying to to find nesting sites so they definitely do like in the middle of the forest and in their like natural sense that's where they go to nest as well they like really really deep spots in the forest and so that's where they're choosing their abandoned buildings also, um, and within those random buildings, they choose pretty secure sites, usually in a corner or a closet. Um, but yeah, deep in the forest, for sure. And finding those is incredibly difficult. Um, I've mostly relied on just tips from you guys and from county officials and landowners uh, to find those buildings and check them out. Um, I know back in the 80s, a vulture researcher, she would actually hire a pilot to take her up in the winter and she'd watch the ground and find these buildings and then go hunt them down on land mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's tough to find them so, so can you recognize a, sorry 
can you recognize a previous nesting location? Like if you go in there after they've nested, can you say, oh, that's a vulture nest? Yeah, absolutely. As long as it's not more than a few years old, um, you can actually see like the, the feces on the wall and you can see feathers and- So they make a mess. They make a big mess and they're stinky. I don't know if you guys have smelled vultures, but they are stinky. So if it's especially recent, you, you can tell. Uh, somebody asked um, uh, in the chat um, if you would speak to the smell, uh, not only their sense of smell, but other parts of smell. <laughs> <laughs> but they are stinky, but for their sense of smell, yeah. Um, so turkey vultures especially have a really, really good sense of smell. Um, and they can, I forget the statistic, but it's, I think they can sense or smell a corpse from like five miles away. Don't, don't trust me on that, but it's, it's a long ways. Um, the black vultures don't have as much of a sense of smell. And so one behavior that's actually really common, they, the black vultures will fly above the turkey vultures and they'll watch where the turkey vultures are going and follow them there. And the black vultures are also a little bit more aggressive. So then they'll steal the food, which is <laughs> interesting. So the turkey vultures often go for like smaller kills, like mice and rabbits that they can eat a lot more quickly before the black vultures get there. There's another question that um, that's uh, uh, let's see. They said, "What ki what kind of numbers are you seeing between the blacks and the turkeys?" Definitely, currently seeing a lot more black vultures. Um, they have way way higher numbers, mm -hmm. but the black vultures also appear to just be more common in our urban areas. The turkey vultures, we still have them in the cities, but they're more common um, outside of the city. So the proportion between the species. In cities, the black vultures are a lot more common. Outside the cities, the turkey vultures will be more common in that population. Um, but we do have good numbers of both here, fortunately. It is interesting. I've been birding and you know some other folks have been birding in the county uh, for a long time, I've 30 years. And when I first got here, it was very difficult to find black vultures. Um, and they and it generally were in the Southern part of the county. And now they seem to be the dominant one, which is interesting. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, the populations actually used to be struggling, but they've rebounded, obviously. And let's see, a couple more questions in the chat. Do you want tips on nesting sites? Absolutely. Please send me any and all tips. I will check it out as long as you don't mind if it's on your property. Um, absolutely. Send them. Yes, she does want tips. Yes. <laughs> Would you consider the reservoir at Kings Mountain Gate? Um, I don't know the Kings Mountain Gateway Trail site. Um, they, I do have another, the Fort Mill Dam, if you guys know that, and that one, if it's similar to that, is a big roost site. So as long as they're roosting there overnight, um, then I would consider that a roost. Well, site. that I don't know, but when I hike along, this is Angel Harris, when I huh? hike along the, um, um, gate, it's a gateway trail in Kings Mountain and the foot trail, you're passing a big reservoir from a mine. Mm -hmm. okay. and vultures fly around there I mean by the dozens at I've seen them at certain times of year it's pretty spooky and <laughs> you can see the levels of the um how the reservoir and the mining has kind of worn down and they sit on this platform I mean there's like 20 30 40 of them hanging out so um I was just you know it's definitely a party you know I, I don't know where they nest but they do gather You'll have to check yeah, it I out. don't. I will. I will have to check that out. Um, if they're flying above it a lot, it could just be good air currents, and so they're catching those air currents to get higher. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's if they're water source, yeah, water source, and I'm sure that there's fishing there. So it absolutely it could be a really good site. Yeah, I'll check it out. Are there any other questions? Oh. Yeah, I have Do another they... question. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so, so how much do vultures migrate? I mean, the vultures we get in the winter, are they coming from the north and then moving back out? Do you have a feel for that? A little bit of both. Um, I don't have a good sense of that yet. That's kind of something I'm hoping to target with my future research. Um, there are a lot of northern black vultures and turkey vultures that will migrate down here, but also we have populations that are here year round. So I don't have a great sense of how much of our winter population are migrators, um, but at least some of it. Yeah. Okay. And let's see, do they build nests? If so, what do they use mostly? So vultures, they don't build nests. Um, 
they just lay them on the ground. They don't try to make any sort of spot for them. They might throw some dirt around, but they don't, they really, they don't put a lot of effort into it, um, which is interesting. It looked like the eggs were just laying there. Yes. They just kind of lay the eggs there. Um, and they're also not very good at like keeping them in a spot. And so they'll often like move away overnight and the vultures kind of lose them. And then they'll have to go like regather them in the morning. And the same with chicks, they lose their chicks a lot when they're really small. Um, it's kind of, it's funny to watch that. And let's see. Okay. Question. One question is handled. Uh huh. There, you know, down in Florida, they always seem to peck at your the rubber uh, mat, you know, the rubber edging around your windows and everything. And they've done it so much where they actually uh, give you a tarp to put over your car. <laughs> And why don't, why don't you see that here? Honestly, I don't know. That's another um, question that I would like to look at in my future research. It's really anywhere in their newer range. Uh, well, actually, Florida, though, is not newer. I've seen it most in their newer range, where they're starting to have more conflicts like that with humans. Um, but I don't know why it's not everywhere. And it's the same with them killing like cattle. They kill a lot of cattle in their new ranges but less so in their established ranges. So I don't know the answer to that, but I am curious. What do, um, what do you think they're, they're trying to do? Do, they, do you think they might think it's a snake or something? Or? They could, I, I also don't know that. <laughs> I've read into it quite a bit and I haven't really found any good reasoning and I, I don't know enough about it. So I don't know. I am really curious about it though. Um, Did and you say they kill cattle? They do, yeah, they do the black vultures, turkey vultures, not so much. They, they're a little less aggressive, but the black vultures can be aggressive. And so they'll actually, if they're hungry enough, they'll get in groups and they will blind cattle and kill them and eat them. <laughs> so yeah. it's a, uh, they'll do so what do they, they have do to. That, do they do that to other animals? I've never heard of vultures yeah. killing <laughs> any. I thought they were just scavengers. Skunks and possums and squirrels, really? anything they can get, fish, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not as common as scavenging, especially in cities where the garbage is easy food, but they will. <laughs> wow, some great questions, Hannah, and you, you uh, handled them. Uh, even the ones you didn't know, you, you sounded like you did. <laughs> that you, that you did. So um, I can't tell you how honored we were to have you with us. Um, it was, that was fascinating. And the first time I saw that video, I was, it just thrilled me to be able to, you know, be a, be a fly on the wall. So thank you so much for uh, your great research. And uh, as far as your name, Partridge, I mean, you're perfect <laughs> for, you, you're, you're ideal for uh, your chosen uh, field. So excellent. <laughs> very, very good. So absolutely. Thank, thank you, you so for much. having me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Um, our next segment, and we'll move right along here is, uh, we, we do this every year at our January membership meeting and something we look forward to. It's our member photography share -thon. So to kick that off, here is Judy Walker. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm gonna bring up an, another screen uh, and I hope I am at least. It's not the one I want. This is the one I want, sorry. Okay, oops up here. All right, we have um, seven folks who have get, uh, are going to share with us. And I'm doing this in alphabetical order, so I'm not playing favorites or anything like that. Um, and here, is, our first uh, person will be Steve Coggin without an S. Uh, Steve, would you go ahead and unmute yourself? I have. Thank you, Judy. There you go. This year, I've spent a lot of time looking at birds that we think of as being very common. And uh, you can't get much more common than American Robin. This guy was in Latta Park last spring and he found this piece of twine and he really wanted that for his nest. So that was a, a nice moment. Next, please. Uh, this is one of the more common birds on migration, not one of the more common warblers on migration. American Red Start. And I caught up with this one after they left here. And this was down in South Florida in Palm Beach County, a little park near my sister's house. And uh, there's, they seem very tame down there, much tamer than they were here. It's really kind of funny. Uh, next, please. 
Uh, this was a mulberry tree near the Salisbury Greenway, and there were lots of birds eating mulberries there. And uh, it looked like one was going to fly into this spot because there were lots to choose from. And uh, this waxwing just hit the right spot at the right moment and <laughs> got stopped. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, this was also down in Florida. This was at uh, Wackadahatchee Wetlands in Palm Beach County. And this was uh, a double crested cormorant, but the birds are so tame there, they let you get so close. Uh, and he was doing such interesting things by turning his head upside down. But look at that, that blue eye and the orange on the beak. It's just fantastic. These little white tufts on the side of his head. I, I just don't see those things very often. And so to see a common bird up close, you can really see some new things. Okay, next please. This is a little field sparrow up in a, a park on a greenway in Forsyth County. I was up there looking for a clay colored sparrow, didn't find it, but this uh, field sparrow looked really nice that morning in the early morning light. Next, please. And this is back to Florida. This was at Green K Wetlands, also in Palm Beach County. And this little pied bill grebe was perfectly reflected in the water that day. Okay. Uh, this is also at Green K Wetlands. This is a, a red winged blackbird. And the sunrise was on the water and it was silhouetted very nicely. Next. Another silhouette. This is a ringbill gull on Lake Norman this fall. Also silhouetted this one in the sunset. Okay. And I think this is the most amazing picture of bird I've ever taken. This is also in Florida, although this is a, a royal turn and it's you know, one of the more common terms we have on our coast. But I was on this jetty in an inlet in Boynton Beach, Clock. and people were fishing there. And I think somebody caught this little fish. It's a lane snapper and didn't want it and threw it back. And this gull scooped it off off the surface of the water. And when it did, it immediately started being chased by laughing gulls that wanted that fish. So this turn was making orbits around this jetty and it must have flown by me 10 times mm. and I managed to get two pictures of it head on with the fish in its mouth and finally it flew off somewhere I hope the the turn got that fish because it worked really hard for it okay next uh I don't know if you've experienced this but I've thought there were a lot of scarlet tanagers this spring I don't know if it's just because I was out more this spring but uh this guy went to the same mulberry tree where the waxwing was and uh, was eating them down. Next, please. This is back to Florida at uh, Wackadahatchee Wetlands. And the sunlight was streaming through the bill of this tricolored heron. It just is glowing yellow. It was just gorgeous. Okay, next, please. That's it. Thank you. Okay, Steve Jenkins, un un unmute yours. I am unmuted. And there you are. Okay, next. Can you see me? Well, uh, yes. First of all, ha Happy New Year to everybody. Um, um, and I just want to say that I've sort of been maintaining my mental and physical um, uh, health uh, through these many months by getting out two or three times a week. Unfortunately, I have not felt comfortable enough to go with groups, um, but with the advent of the vaccines and uh, some herb, herd immunization, I look forward once again to joining uh, the groups and learning um, as much as possible from my uh, fellow Audubon uh, folks because I'm still a crappy birder, but I'm a, a, a fairly decent photographer. Anyway, first picture um, is a, a golden crown kinglet um, from McAlpine Creek Park. 
Um, McAlpine, McAlpine Creek probably has become my favorite site um, uh, during, during the fall and winter uh, season. Uh, as everybody knows, these kinglets are sort of perpetual motion machines, difficult to photograph. This particular one um, was kind enough to do its perpetual motion in a small area and to hover occasionally. Next slide, please. Um, another of my go-to places has become Clark's Creek uh, Nature Preserve. Um, I particularly like it because I go through the week and I'm often the only person there. Um, this is a house finch. Um, uh, there were a bunch of house finches and uh, American goldfinches bathing in the little runoff from the pond there. And I thought this was just kind of particularly cute, splashing and, and fluffing and being a bird. Um, next, please. Um, I, early on, before I got brave enough to leave my bubble, I did a lot of birding in my backyard. Um, uh, uh, and this is a cedar waxwing. I had a bunch of cedar wax wing, waxwings for a number of days and weeks going after service berries in our yard. And they're right up against our house and it gave me wonderful opportunities to photograph them. Uh, next, please. Um, this is back to um, uh, Clark's Creek. Um, pretty reliably at the pond there, and even more so at the beaver pond at McAlpine Creek Park, I've come across belted kingfishers. And often they're um, cooperative enough to be fishing for me. So you can get all kinds of nice diving shots and uh, coming up out of the water shots. And this particular, I, I think it's a female, is that right, Judy? No, it's a male. Male, okay. This particular uh, belted kingfisher um, at McAlpine Creek at the beaver pond, when it was hunting, it did occasional hovering pretty close to me. So it enabled me to get a picture um, like this. Uh, next, please. Um, although I've noticed they have not been reported in eBird and I have not been an eBirder um, other than to look for the hotspots and so forth. Twice now, uh, when I've gone to Clark's Creek, I have found hooded mergansers. One time, which was when this picture was taken, just one male was there. And more recently, um, uh, I had two males and a female. Uh, really easily spooked like a lot of other waterfowl, but um, I've learned some hiding places around the pond there. And if I'm quiet, um, I have an opportunity to observe them and photograph them uh, for quite a while. Uh, next, please. Um, I have made numerous trips to PD um, in the fall and winter, again, through the week. Um, and I've ranged all over the, the place there, usually see maybe one person during the day or something like that. And for me, and I guess for most of us, um, the signature bird there is the red-headed uh, woodpeckers. And um, I've got a gazillion shots of them, one day sort of aerial combat between northern flickers and red-headed woodpeckers, um, et cetera. But uh, PD is a really fun place to just get, get out uh, to. Next, please. So this is back to McAlpine. Um, so I'm at the beaver pond. This was, um, let's see, December 18th. This is quite recently. I'm photographing um, a great blue heron in the beaver pond. There's a great egret there. There's a kingfisher. There's a, um, a red-shouldered hawk close by. And then all of a sudden, as I'm doing this, I see one pileated woodpecker drop in. And it, I, I hadn't had, I, I had had a few photographs of pileated woodpeckers before, but not great luck with them. And before too long, there were two pileated woodpeckers there and they stayed there for quite a while. And um, um, they've afforded me uh, multiple opportunities in several different locations adjacent to the beaver pond to photograph them. Impress, impressive birds. Uh, next, please. Um, this is also McAlpine Creek Park, and this is the great blue heron that I know has been there for at least two years. Uh, it usually hangs out near the larger pond there. It has a left leg injury, and actually this year, it finally the foot dropped off, <laughs> but it seems to get around just fine. And this, this bird 
is so used to being around people. Judy, one day when we were out there last year, uh, I was fascinated by this bird while you guys were off um, with, with, I think it was a red-tailed or red-shouldered hawk that was on the ground close by. This bird is, just lets you get amazingly close uh, to it for long periods of time. Um, and I thought it made a nice portrait. Next, please. So probably the highlight of my year, we, we have a barred owl house on our property in, in some woods that we have. Put it up three years ago because we had noticed barred owls around our neighborhood and around our property. And I had actually been photographing them for a while. So I said, what the heck, Let, let's put up a barred owl house. So this was three years ago, put it up relatively late in the season and immediately it was occupied. We had a successful uh, fl um, nesting and fledging and had one uh, uh, owlet that I photographed for a number of weeks and months. The following year, Mama Raccoon took over uh, and it had four kits in our house. Our owls were still around, but they did not nest in the box. This past year, we had another successful nesting with two owlets and many weeks and months of fun for me. Um, and following the owls, we had a swarm of honeybees that took over our, our um, uh, box and actually had to get the Mecklenburg beekeepers out to extract the bees. Um, th these two guys, or I don't know if they're guys or gals or what, visit us multiple times and they seem to really like each other. Uh, next, please. This is Mama Owl. Uh, one, of, one of the nice things about having a successful nesting is I think they have to get more food than they normally do. So a lot of hunting takes place um, during the day rather than just at night. And I was able to observe and photograph that a, a lot uh, this, this, uh, this past year. Next, please. Um, raptors are probably my favorite thing. This is back to um, McAlpine Creek Park. And this is, I believe, um, a juvenile um, uh, red-shouldered hawk eating a snake. Again, very close to the beaver pond there. I posted a series of photographs, or maybe a couple of series of photographs, with a lot of predation uh, by a couple of, um, I think it's a couple of different uh, red-shouldered hawks that just stayed around, did multiple hunts and, and eatings very close by to me. Uh, next, please. Um, this is one of my, uh, what I call rock star raptors from the year. This is back to Clark's Creek. And I've had at least two prolonged encounters with this um, juvenile sub-adult um, red-tailed hawk who just has done the greatest poses for me. This is actually in the, tr the big tree by the small pond there, but I have photographed this bird at multiple different locations at Clark's Creek. Uh, next, please. And then um, through Instagram, I discovered by, uh, one, through one of the people that I follow, uh, that Riverbend Park uh, uh, in Catawba County near Conover um, is a good place for um, bald eagles. And I've gone there twice, and both times I have found bald eagles. The first time, which is what when this picture um, comes from, and, and that was uh, on November 23rd, I found two immatures, which one of which was this one and one adult bald eagle. And the last time I went up there, which was on the 29th of December, found three or four different adults. Next picture, please. Um, this is one of the adults uh, from my second trip to Riverbend. A great place to view them is there's a parking area right by the river there after you drive in. There's, there's like a little concrete platform that goes out to the river and I've had good luck with the uh, eagles um, there. Um, this last time I was there, I ran across a couple of the managers of the park who made the mistake of telling me that eagles are often uh, on a tower next to a dam that is just outside of River Bend Park. Next picture, please. Um, and it separates the Catawba River with Lake Hickory behind it. And near this dam is this tower, uh, which is to the right side as you're facing it from the park. Uh, when they first came by, there were no eagles on there, but I kept looking over there and eventually I saw two adult bald eagles there, but they were too damn far away. 
So I had a little adventure trying to get closer to them and uh, got several pictures of them on top of the tower and kind of cruising around the tower. And I, I think that's it. Yep. Angel, do you know how to turn on your... Oh, yeah. Unmute yourself. Okay, so... There I am. So I... Yes. Um, well, you know, Lucy was a great hostess. I went to try to see the hummingbird and I just brought, you know, my handy digital camera with me and I don't use it that often. So I'm like, I better just try my zooms and try my this and try my that. And here came this cardinal sat on the white fence. I thought I captured um, a, a, a really nice portrait of a cardinal. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And the next one is the hummingbird. That's good. Uh, That's not good. bad. I mean, I you know, mm -hmm. I enjoyed I enjoyed seeing her, mm -hmm. and uh, I was happy to get the glow on her neck. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that's it. Mm -hmm. All righty. Hey, Gretchen. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can. Okay. <laughs> um, so these first couple of pictures are from India. Um, early in the year, uh, I had a business trip to India, and then I took about five days afterward to um to go see some birds in in the western ghats so this is a, a malabar gray hornbill um in an area of the western ghats called kurg um and they <laughs> and uh it was kind of neat because the place i was staying um they had a, a couple of blinds they call them hides and uh, they feed the birds every morning. And so this is a banana that this bird is tossing and eating. So next, please. And um, this is also in India in a uh, area called Mysore. It's a old historical town. Um, and this is a Eurasian hoopoe. I just thought they were really cool looking birds. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, this is uh, also in Mysore at a park in Mysore. I was sitting kind of just resting for a little while and this common kingfisher was uh, perched there so nicely and then diving down and, and fishing, but just love his colors. So, uh, Right after India, I went to Arizona for a long weekend. Um, I, I had a, a conference there <laughs> and uh, spent a day uh, birding. And I just love those little gambels quail that, that run all around uh, Arizona. This is Green Valley, Green Valley, Arizona. Right. And now these next pictures are from um, my yard and Fort Mill. So this um, American bittern was basically in my backyard. <laughs> we have a, a, a pond behind our house. We, we live on the golf course or off the golf course. And uh, he showed up uh, one day and uh, I could see him from my porch and was like, what the heck? Um, and uh, so uh, a, a few folks uh, came over to, to see him. Oops. And uh, this is another, another bird uh, that's in our backyard. We, we have had for the past, well, since we've been living here about six years, every year the hooded mergansers show up about mid-November. And the numbers kind of go up and down, um, but we, we have them pretty regularly. And then I spent a lot of time trying to capture hummingbird photos this summer uh, because there were a lot of folks uh, posting really great action shots of hummingbirds. So um, I'm still trying to get the perfect shot, but um, but I thought this one turned out okay. 
and then one of our neighbors has a um an owl box and has had barred owls for the past couple of years and and even put a little uh camera in there so we could watch them at night and uh see what they were doing um and this is one of the babies they had they had two babies that successfully fledged sweet and this is also in fort mill um there's a a little pond i went around trying to discover different ponds uh a couple weekends just seeing what might be there um and was really happy to find like eight um, wood ducks all just sitting at the end of this pond uh, in the sun one morning and, um, and was lucky enough to get a picture. And uh, this little uh, indigo bunting was across the street from us at the Ann Springs Close Greenway. Um, it's a great uh, greenway for those of you who, who um, haven't been there. Um, and uh, it's a spot I, I go to a lot. This was down on Fripp Island, um, a painted bunting uh, that was singing one morning on, on Fripp Island this summer. Wait a second. Here we go. And um, uh, black neck stilt in Buford, also um, on that same trip. And uh, a snowy egret. Uh, the area in Fripp we were at had a, a couple of different um, roosts. And the, uh, the snowy egrets and the great egrets and tricolor herons were all roosting and, um, and had nests uh, there in, um, in June, early June. And um, an American oyster catcher on Kiowa from November. What's he eating? I don't know. No. I couldn't figure that out. Some little thing. <laughs> and then this is um, the most recent of these. This is a white-tailed kite um, down uh, at uh, Frog Pond Wildlife Management Area, which is right at the entrance to the Everglades. Hey, Christine, your turn. Christine? Yes. Okay, Judy. <laughs> Come on. Are you there? <laughs> <laughs> Took a minute to unmute. Okay. Um, this is um, one of the only trips I really took this year. I, we got to Naples in February before everything started, uh, visiting friends. And um, so this is an anhingo, which I, it's not my favorite bird, but boy, when it's in breeding uh, plumage, it's pretty spectacular. Um, compared to some of the few that we've had stop by, not in breeding locally here, but uh, we get these really cool angel wings, which I think are neat. Next. This is a black crowned night heron um, from Arley Gardens near Carolina Beach. Uh, he was sort of hiding in the shade and I was able to get pretty close and I just thought it was a pretty cool pose. So I really liked that one. Next. This is my baby Wren, another only a, a face only a mother could love kind of bird shot. Uh, this literally is fledgling day. I mean, he just had pin feathers and all kinds of junk on him from the, from the nest. Um, they, the, they laid the eggs in, in a basket full of mixed flowers that I had on my deck. And this guy took a huge like six foot leap out of there and, and ran into my garden edge and that's where he, he was. So a few hours out of the nest. Next. Uh, this is a common yellow throat. Uh, this is from Six Mile. We had a lot of great warblers at, at Six Mile this spring. This was in early May and I just really like his cute pose. 
This is a female red start. Um, and this is actually from my garden and one of the new yard birds I added this spring. Actually fall, this would have been in September. Um, and I was just pleased to get a shot. I like the way that her, her yellow, her yellow highlights match the leaves nearby. So I thought she was really pretty. Next, this is a female grosbeak, and uh, this was on May 1st. And we had just started hearing reports that grosbeaks were coming through for a couple of weeks and I didn't have one yet. And um, this female came about a week before I had a couple of young males, but she was particularly accommodating, very brave. Let me get pretty close. I, I Tons of shots. Like she looks like she's just looking right at me. So she was, I was thrilled that she was right there in the backyard for, for a couple of weeks. Next. This is a um, great crested fly catcher. And this is actually through glass. This is outside my office window. Um, I have a pair of nesting red-shouldered hawks at my office building and they often hang out in this tree. That I'm on the second floor and they're usually eye level, like hanging out with me. And um, so my coworkers think I'm crazy. I'm constantly looking out the window and, and one day, uh, the guy sitting across from me said, I think you have a friend. There's a, there's a new bird outside the window. And I turned around and he looked, he also kind of like the gross beak, looked like he was looking right at me. So first time I really had a close look, quite often they're way high up on the treetops. So this was pretty cool that he came to, to visit me. That was in June. Uh, goldfinches, they uh, were really accommodating this year. This is from August. Uh, you know, it's kind of nice when spring migration is over and things quiet down a little, but the, the, um, these, these birds stay bright and, and love these flowers. And I've often seen them on there, but they're pretty skittish. And um, I'd really been trying for a long time to get them to pose. And I, I like the way I was able to get the, the female in the, um, in the background and him in the forefront. And I have a lot of shots of the opposite. They, I got close without them realizing I was there and they, they gave me a, a lot of shots. So that was fun. Uh, Pied-Bill Grebe. This was the first time I visited Rankin Lake Park. And um, this is the closest I've ever gotten to one. They really come right up to the edge of the little lake there. So I just like the way the sun was hitting them and how smooth his feathers are from all that um, underwater diving that they do. Purple finch, although kind of just barely, it seems, but I was excited. I've been waiting for the purple finch invasion. Everybody been talking about it. And all I had was females. And since then, all I still have is mostly females, one or two, once in a while. Um, but this one guy came through on December 8th. So I was thrilled to, to get a photograph of more of a Northern bird. Hummingbird, like many, many people have been saying, that was sort of the COVID hobby this year, I think. Getting hummingbirds to your feeders and actually trying to get pictures of them. Um, I, don't, I don't have a high uh, speed camera. This is, I have like a bridge camera across between a, a point and shoot and a, and a uh, now I'm losing my thoughts, the big lens. But anyway, took tons and tons and tons of Hummingbird pictures, rarely could get very close, but um, this one gave a rare moment of rest. This was in late September. Um, every now and then you catch them resting and I just think it's so cute to see a little hummingbird eyelid. <laughs> That's that one. This is the Ross's goose that showed up on uh, Lake Norman. This is from November 22nd. And um, we'd kind of been chasing it from the boat on the lake and we noticed that it went up on the lawn. So uh, we, we noted on Google where the address was. And after I got off the boat, I drove around and uh, found it hanging out on the lawn with all these Canada geese. And I love this picture. They just look like two humans having a conversation. Like the Ross's goose is probably trying to, I don't know, he's, he's telling the Canada goose, I don't know how I got here. <laughs> I know I don't fit in, uh, but you know, they seem to be getting along pretty well. This is a pine siskin, another one that I was waiting for uh, this season. 
uh, this is November 17th. Same kind of thing. People have been reporting it for weeks and I did not have them, did not have them. And finally they came and someone told me that they are not shy and usually will let you get pretty close for pictures. And I have to agree once they, once they finally came down um, to my feeders, they are very accommodating and let you get close. So I, I like the way the, the background of the trees is blurred out and you can really see how small and dainty and pointy, how very pointy their beaks are is pretty cool. This is a thrasher, a brown thrasher from August, uh, a young juvenile. I have, um, I think it's some kind of olive uh, hedge, a really large hedge between my house and the neighbor's house. Um, and the birds all love to take cover there. Uh, in between when they visit my feeders and, and can come back down. And um, the cool thing about it is for some reason, they let me get up to the hedge really close. Like they're so afraid of everything else, but I can come up to the hedge and stick my head in the hedge. And they see, it's like, they don't see me. Once you get that close, they don't see you. Um, so sometimes you're almost too close. You feel there. I've had them like a foot from my face, but um, this guy, uh, was kind of fluffed up. I guess he's he's so young, and I just love that he has those two long uh, tail feathers coming in. This is my last photo. This is a, a willet from uh, Carolina Beach in October, and uh, I got up really early in the morning before many of the other people did, and got, and got a lot of nice pictures of willets and and sanderlings, and um, I just really enjoyed. Um, the background of the sky and the sea foam and all the grayish blue shades. Um, I think he looks pretty cool. So that's it. Hey, Jack. Jack. Hello. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. This one's a little bit different. Yeah, this uh, is the male resplendent uh, Quetzal. Uh, it's the national bird of Guatemala, but they are most uh, likely to be found in Costa Rica because they've taken better care of their trees. Um, this is in the Monteverde cloud forest. And um, I'll be quiet a second so you can hear the sound. I think this is the mating call because it was breeding season. No, I guess we're not hearing a lot of it. Um, Quiet. And then, he, then he flies off and I guess he, he found what he was looking for. Um, but this is in the Monte Verde cloud forest, which is uh, probably the easiest place to see these birds. They're not uh, in danger, they're near, near endangered. Um, and this is a, about a 16 inch bird with a 26 inch tail. Uh, we were, Pat and I were with a guide. You have to have a guide to go into the Monte Verde. And uh, the three of us were walking along the trail and the guide all of a sudden just sort of had this sense and he uh, turned around and this was actually in back of us. He had a scope and I just had my iPhone. So this was taken with an iPhone through a, a, a spotting scope. Um, and um, that's about these birds, as many of you know or might know, um, they're indigenous from Mexico through Panama, uh, but Costa Rica is definitely the place to see them. Okay. Okay, Martina. We need to move along a little bit more. I think we're losing people, among other things. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not sure what order they're in. I um, tried to give them the order you gave them to me. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, this we started out the year this year in the Outer Banks. Uh, so this was taken during the first week of uh, January last year. Um, this is a purple sandpiper um, at the uh, old or the at Oregon Inlet on the old Coast Guard jetty, the southern jetty there in Oregon Inlet. 
Um, this purple sandpiper, that's a young one, was very accommodating. Um, we had a lot of good views. We had a good couple minutes or several minutes. Sure. Okay. Um, yep, this is here. Uh, at, these are tundra swans at Pungo. Um, so Pocosin National Wildlife Refuge, the Pungo unit. Uh, it's really in the middle of nowhere. I think it's in three counties, Washington County, Hyde, and I don't want to say Turrell County. Um, but the swans there are fantastic. We had a trumpeter swan, um, along with over 10,000 tundras, several thousand snow geese, um, probably well over 100,000 red-winged blackbirds and other blackbirds. So it's a pretty crazy place. Um, I know a lot of people went out uh, this spring and summer to check out the Brent Higler Road dick sizzles over my, my part of the uh, state, Union County. Um, and uh, the males were very, uh, there's more male, there were more males this year than I've seen in previous years. I think we had at least four or five singing males. Um, and they're very, this one is specifically was very accommodating. Um, he let me get pretty close several times on different trips. Um, so I was really happy with this shot. Um, and then in August, this was a short-billed dowager, immature, juvenile. Um, this is, was taken at Cape Hatteras uh, at the campground. Um, so the campground's very low, of course, if you've ever been there, especially in the summer, uh, every time it rains, it floods. Uh, and August, of course, is shorebird time. So uh, the fields were covered in shorebirds, um, mostly pectoral sandpipers, leasts, uh, semi-palmated sandpipers and plovers. Um, and it was nice, I could use my car as a blind. So what I actually did for these dowagers was I got out of my car, they were on the other side of my car. And I just crawled on my belly and poked my head around the, the front of my car. Uh, and they, they didn't mind at all. They actually went to sleep. So um, yeah, I was pretty happy with this shot. And I also did a pelagic um, off Hatteras uh, in late August. Um, and saw a lot of cool pelagic birds. Of course, black cap petrel is sort of your default Hatteras bird. Um, so yeah, I was really happy to get this shot. They're really hard to photograph, especially when you're on a, a moving ship with really fast moving birds and rough seas. It wasn't too rough, but um, still the waves can hide birds pretty well. So this guy made a really close pass behind the boat. Um, so I was pretty happy with that. Um, and of course, myself, like many others, did a lot of yard birding. Um, and this year, my yard was pretty good. I usually don't ever get any warblers, or if I do, I only get one or two, and it's usually a red start. Um, but uh, thanks to, I think, the spruce budworm work, uh, breakout um, in the boreal forest up in Canada, we had a ton of Cape Mays. I had Cape May warblers in the yard every day for like almost three weeks. Uh, in September and October. Um, so this was my favorite little yard warbler. Um, this, he's a nice little non-breeding male Cape May warbler. Um, had a bunch of black-throated greens, red starts, perulas, uh, white-eyed vireo, red-eyed vireo, cuckoos, yellow-billed cuckoo. So yeah, it was pretty fun, uh, a pretty fun fall in the yard. Um, so I only did really like outside of a couple, you know, North Carolina, like Virginia trips in South Carolina. Um, I did only one really big trip, and this was uh, in late the last week week of October, first week of November, uh, up to Cape May. Um, so this is a little northern saw wet owl that they had caught um, up there, and uh, absolutely tiny, adorable little guys. Um, we got to pet them and watch them get released. I, I released this one actually. Um, so it was a really awesome experience. Uh, and we also, so Cape May, uh, I highly recommend it to anybody. Um, it's just insane for birds. Uh, this is a, a, a young bald eagle carrying a fish. And you can see in the background, there is a broad wing talk uh, immature in the background there. Um, it's just a fantastic place to watch migration. Uh, you can, I mean, we had, uh, it's not peak raptor migration first week of November, but still tons of raptors moving through, um, including uh, harriers, Sharption hawk, Cooper's hawk. Um, it was really cool. We watched harriers go out over the uh, Delaware Bay um, on their way to the south. So that's really cool. Uh, and there's also sort of now the trend in 
Cape May and other places is um, spotting birds at night. So uh, they've got a couple of people up there have uh, thermal cameras. And what they do is they stand on the hawk watch platform at dusk and at night, and they look at the thermal imaging and they can actually see the birds migrating over at night. So as many of you already know, um, most of our birds migrate at night. Uh, only a smaller handful actually migrate during the day. Um, so this was actually a short-eared owl that was migrating at night, um, headed south. Uh, so while it is not a good photo necessarily, uh, it is a good photo for what it was. Um, so basically, you'll spot the birds uh, with the, the thermal cameras and then spotlight them. Um, so the short-eared was probably one of the cooler ones. We had long-eared owl, we had uh, osprey, which was just super cool. Um, woodcocks, uh, ducks, like wood ducks. Um, we had we common yellow throat, pipits, uh, robins. So a lot of like common birds, but it's just neat to see them actually migrating at night. And speaking of long-eared owls, this was actually taken on Halloween night. Um, so it was a pretty good Halloween treat. Uh, this is a presumably a male long-eared owl. He was pretty small, um, but they caught there as well. So that was also really cool. Um, they had caught a second one, which I didn't include, but uh, so it was really nice to compare two of them. Um, and that night, earlier that night, we had seen several take off uh, at dusk. So that was cool. Uh, and here is one of the lifers I got on that trip, this is Lapland Longspur at the Avalon Beach Jetty. Um, so we had heard that there was a long spur that had landed. Usually they fly by the sea watch there, um, but this one looked like it had landed. Uh, so we went out and checked it um, and we got up on the jetty and we found this dapper little long spur um, feeding on the rocks. So that was pretty cool. Uh, I like photographing birds on jetties. They tend to be very tame. Um, so like that purple sandpiper earlier. Um, so it was pretty nice, a uh, good way to get a lifer. Uh, and this was the bird, my favorite bird um, of probably 2020. It was this gorgeous northern goshawk, uh, absolute huge bird. I've never, you know, so I'd never seen one before. Um, and we were sitting at Coral Street uh, where they, we were just watching the bay and watching birds migrate. Um, and I'd seen, you know, hundreds of Cooper's hawks that week and sharp shinned hawks. Um, and this bird just kind of pops out from behind the trees. And I was like, oh God, that's like a big, got a uh, cooper's hawk um and baxter uh my boyfriend said no that's a goshawk um so it was pretty br amazing just one of those just fascinating birds um definitely it was just like it still makes my heart race when i think about it it's really cool so that was great and uh pat of course the theme of this year is finches so if you guys attended my finch seminar um a lot of the photos i take took there were taken at Cape May. Um, I think we saw well over 20,000 pine siskins in the days we were there. Um, one, that, that day of the goshawk, I know we had 6,900 on the list. Um, and it was just cool. It was super cool to see flocks of these birds. Basically, they, they really make up their minds to migrate right then. So you see these flocks of siskins going up and down the dunes and then Every once in a while, they actually just, you can watch the whole flock take off and go out over the bay, which is just really awesome. Um, so you see flocks of siskins over ocean, the, uh, the bay over water. So it's kind of crazy. Um, but at points, you'd just be standing there and the flock would just move through us. So you're like part around you, which is really cool. And of course, um, the theme was also gross beaks. Also lots of gross beaks moved in while we were there. Um, we had about 250. Um, and by the end of the trip, it was almost kind of, you got used to them. Uh, they just fly over in big flocks, um, but though most of them didn't put down. Um, these guys were visiting some feeders, so we were able to go and see them. So of course, seeing them up close is just great. And then this is just my one of them, an artsy shot. Um, Kate Mayo has a lot of really good photo opportunities. So this is a uh, young green wing or immature. I don't think he's an immature. I think he's going to back into winter plumage. Um, green wing teal. Um, the bird, you know, the ducks there are pretty tame. Not like our ducks who, you know, if you get within a mile radius of them, they seem to, and you look at them wrong, they're gone. Um, there they can be quite uh, tame, especially at the state park there. So um, yeah, it was a pretty fun trip. Um, definitely recommend. If you're ever up there. Okay.
Richard, last but not least. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully not least. No, not least at all. I did like uh, Steve this year. I spent an awful lot of time at the parks because we've stayed very isolated as well, but we did get to go to Ecuador. We left on March 28th. It was a leap year this year. So we had, I mean, February 28th. Right. So we had two days in February and we spent those with a private guide before joining a group tour, which was not a birding tour. And we went up into Min the Mindo area, the um, uh, cloud forests that are uh, a couple of hours north and east of uh, Pico. And so yes. he took several spots where we could see uh, lots of hummingbirds. And this is a white third of Jacobin. All right, next. We also had uh, four days in uh, the Amazon basin in Ecuador. We went down the Napo River about 40 miles from the airport and stayed at the Napo Center. And this is, uh, well, Hannah would like this if you like stinky birds, because this is a stinky turkey. It's called a Watson. And it actually can be traced back genetically to the dinosaurs, so 64 million years. And they're ruminators. And so that's their, um, basically, is their strategy for survival is to be stinky. Mm -hmm. So they, they're not uh, predated because they're, the meat's not very desirable. Uh, so this is along the river. This is, um, I'm going to have to get my notes on these different hummingbirds. It's a brown, so, brown violet ear. Brown violet ear. This is a little bit less common one, but it's uh, one that's found up in the highlands. And this was probably at about, what, 11,000 feet or so. Mm -hmm the cloud forest. And uh, this, I think, was at the same site, a crimson rump toucanet, and it found um, just in the humid forests in Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela. Uh, next. This one is really cool. This is the long-tailed sylph, and it's got a relatively short bill <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> compared to its tail, that uses sometimes to pierce flowers. Uh, and this little guy is a purple-throated wood star. And um, they look like a humming, like a bumblebee when they fly. They do. <laughs> They're really cool little birds. Uh, we saw, when we were at Napo, we went back to a couple of parrot salt licks. And one of them was uh, along the river, and there was an awful lot of different varieties of green parrots. But we went to this one that was back in the jungle, and there were uh, a few scarlet macaws that came in. And so I got this. Unfortunately, the light was was uh, you know it was really dark in the jungle. Um, and next, we also spent seven days on a boat in the Galapagos. Um, we were totally out of range of what was going on in the world, which was really a wonderful thing, because when we finally got within range, we found out that they were closing Ecuador the next day because of COVID, and we were being sent home. So this is a, a, the famous blue-footed booby, and then the Galapagos penguin. Um, the Galapagos penguin is the only penguin that's found north of the equator, just barely. And it's because of the currents. There are cold currents that run along South America. And this is one of the famous Galapagos mockingbirds. These were the birds that inspired Darwin to start paying attention to uh, the differences in species. So we always hear about the finches, but the mockingbirds were really the ones first. And uh, there are up to five different species of mockingbirds between the different islands, and they're distinct species. And they have distinct habits. This one was actually at the Darwin Center. Okay. And this is one of, uh, this is a pair of frigate birds. These are great frigate birds, which are quite large, but not quite as large as the magnificent frigate birds. The, uh, the great frigate birds have this green sheen and uh, of course they were nesting and we were able to get very close to them. They're scavenger birds and, and pirate birds. So they don't have enough um, water resistance on their feathers to go down into water, but they will go and steal from other birds. And they also 
tend to follow the boats. And so we had probably about 15 of them that followed our boat one day, just hovering. They're, they're, they're wonderful uh, masters of uh, taking hovering on the air currents. And they just followed along our boat for probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes, and then finally kind of took off to a, an island on the right. All right, now we're back home. And like Steve, I was at McAlpine <coughs> Creek Park and uh, the famous one-footed great blue heron. And uh, he was sitting up in that tree over there, kind of between the ponds, if you've been over there. And uh, the, the uh, great egret was also, one of the great egrets was sitting on the, um, right on the path. And a couple of fishermen had been fishing and they came and threw this fish down. And both of the birds went for it, but the great blue heron got it and took off. And I, even though I had my focus settings wrong, I was able to catch the bird in focus. So that was really a pretty cool thing. Uh, I saw this ruby crown kinglet. Actually, there were a pair of them that were really quite cooperative over at Chantilly one afternoon, late one afternoon. And I just like this picture because you do see a little bit of the ruby crown. And um, these birds were not paying too much attention to me, so I was able to get quite a few little shots of them. This is over at Clark's Creek Nature Preserve, the uh, red-tailed hawk. The same one. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this guy was sitting on that bare tree over by the pond, which y'all are a lot of you are probably familiar with. And I was up toward that um, wooded area on the other side of the field. And I saw the bird take off and come right toward me. And so I got a whole lot of, of really good shots. Um, this one was one of the better ones, but the, the sky that afternoon, and I'm telling on myself a little bit, was kind of a flat, ugly sky. So uh, this is a little bit of an enhanced sky. And this will be a little bit of a story because of the uh, another one that's coming up in just a moment. This is at McAlpine Creek Park too. Had a lot of fun watching that osprey work. <laughs> and then the final one, which is... Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's fine, too. And then the final one, <laughs> you know, this is great. We'll end on a couple of black vultures. This was at McAlpine Creek, uh, the Sardis Road entrance, heading Green. the Greenway. I'm sorry, at the Greenway, heading toward Providence Road. One. Uh, I think it was about October 17th or so. It was just before Halloween. And uh, there were about 30 or 35 mm -hmm. of these black vultures that were sitting up in some of the trees kind of right over the path. And um, so I got a couple of shots and I guess this is Bonnie and Clyde, but mm -hmm. I spent a little time doing some little Photoshop type magic and making it look like something that would be kind of cool for Halloween. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Excellent work. I'm so proud of everybody who contributed to that. Really, really cool. And, uh, you know, if I look at all of the uh, mass photographers we have, they have vocations ranging from attorneys to eye doctors, physicians, professors, bankers, trademark analysts, college students. I mean, it's the whole gamut of people who chose those things for their vocations. But we're just delighted that their avocations as photography. It was truly a spectacular show. Thank you all very, very much. Excellent. All right, I guess we better wrap, wrap this show up. It's 8.51, um, but it was a, a great night, a lot going on and um, it was recorded. So we'll send out link, links to the program um, on the website and other places. So if you know anyone who'd like to take a look, they can do that. Uh, just another reminder, uh, please join us on February 4th when we go south of the border with our Birds of Durango, Mexico speaker. And uh, if you joined on Facebook Live, thank you so much for being here. And again, we'll see you next month. So we can uh, end our Facebook Live feed, please. And uh, if, um, there we go. Uh -huh. Anybody who wants to stay around and chat,